Mike Dolan is VP of Strategic Programs, responsible for collaborative projects and legal programs at the Linux Foundation. He's helped farm over 200 open source, open hardware, and open standards projects, covering a wide range of technology segments. And uh, he's going to talk about Risk Five and other free hardware projects at Linux Foundation. Um, there are going to be slides here. And in the meantime, Mike, you can tell us something interesting about yourself, which is not on this resume. Or brief profile, as they say. All right, while we're waiting, uh, one thing you may not know about me is I have three young children. So I did a trip this week from uh, Lyon, France, where we had our Open Source Summit Europe, to Cleveland. I went trick-or-treating last night and uh, was on a 5 a.m. flight here this morning. So, <laughs> And uh, if I'm jet-lagged or seem a little bit off, it might be because of that. And I'm also flying to Paris to this afternoon. So around the world. Um, I think uh, Mishi asked me to give a talk about what's going on in the hardware ecosystems. Um, I'm going to go fast because I, I know we're trying to catch up on time, and I, I do like to be uh, appreciative of pe being between uh, people and lunch. Um, one of the things that you, you, we, we've talked about this over and over, uh, open source is one of the great enablers of innovation. Um, it, it's something that has really transformed how we uh, do things around the world. It has enabled many different types of innovations that have accelerated what we can do as society. Um, you know, but our, at the Linux Foundation, our communities, it, it, our members, our, the developers, the engineers we work with, they've pushed us into new directions. And, and I wanted to frame the converse, a conversation around hardware by how did we get here? It all started with Linux, right? I, we are named the Linux Foundation. Previously, we're the OSDL or the free, and the Free Standards Group, which were merged together to form the Linux Foundation. But it started with Linux, you know, something that was, you know, collectively developed. It was an operating system. It was freely licensed. It was this like, you know, experiment that took off, and commercial companies came together and they started working on it together. And unlike other things in history, they actually work successfully together. And, and you know, the fact that that was able to be done successfully might have been a one-trick event, um, but it wasn't. And people got over the GPLv2 license and all the concerns and challenges. Terry's laughing, but he helped IBM uh, foray through that um, minefield for many years. And, you know, people, once they started to become part of that community, started to accept what they were working on together, and they entered into a shared risk and a shared responsibility to help perpetuate it further. And that led innovative minds to say, why not do this for something else around Linux? And Linux Foundation, can you help us? And there were innovative people at Intel who came up with a project called Yocto Project for laying down Linux onto embedded hardware. Um, and a fantastic idea, and are there others in the industry who want to work on that? And there were. There were others who were looking at carrier grade opportunities to use Linux in telco equipment. And there were other people who wanted to work on that as well. And the Linux Foundation was able to help bring people together, help them form a structure around which they could collaborate on these other initiatives. And by doing so, they had the, in, again invested into that community and they took on a shared risk and a shared responsibility for perpetuating it further. And then that story leaked. This is, you know, for the Linux Foundation, you know, you have to understand we're, we're composed of a lot of members, we have a lot of developers, a lot of ecosystems. We tend to be fairly um, conservative in a number of areas just because we don't want to disrupt the balance. But we had uh, a number of communities who wanted to take the Linux Foundation into a different direction beyond just Linux itself. And so suddenly we were hosting in 2013 the Open Daylight Project, which had nothing to do with Linux. It was a software-defined network controller. And so if you're using software-defined networking, Open Daylight might be one of the controllers that you're using. There are others. We host a few more. But it was where we started on this journey beyond just Linux. And we moved beyond just the utilities and frameworks around how you deployed or, or implemented Linux in industry. And then we moved into a phase of what I'll call advanced acceleration. Um, this is, 
you know, in part of an explosion of an idea, but there was an idea that Open Daylight laid, which was that we could put a governance structure, an intellectual property framework, and a messaging and communications model around an open source project, and industries could gravitate towards that project and use it and, uh, and do great things with them. And that parlayed over into other areas. Whether it was you know, industry tooling, if it was integration testing frameworks, there was features and functions being created. We had entirely new technology segments that were born in open source that were, we were able to accelerate the adoption of that technology by reducing all of those barriers that they often had to overcome every single time. And you know, we went into security and privacy. Let's Encrypt uh, is now the number one certificate authority in the world. It is a great project to support and sponsor, by the way, and uh, they could always use more help. Um, but in all of these cases, what we had is a set of companies who had an idea. Maybe it was just a few. They came together, they put something together that they were willing to do in a neutral fashion at the Linux Foundation. And the neutrality component is very important because what they did is they laid down their swords and they said, we're going to do this out in the open and I don't need to be able to control the project anymore. I don't know where it's going to go and we'll all be at the table making decisions about what happens from here on forward. And when we set up the governance structure around these projects, anybody can contribute, anybody can participate. You don't have to be a member of the Linux Foundation or a member of the project in order to uh, make any part of decisions. And, but what that did is it created this neutral space where people could contribute in a way that was not binding them to anything else. And we went into open standards and specifications being developed in conjunction often with open source uh, projects themselves. And so now you're hearing about uh, Joint Development Foundation or uh, Open uh, Container Initiative, which is uh, the, the basic container image uh, specifications that you're all dependent upon. And then you know, new technologies like GraphQL when you start talking about how you're building APIs. Um, I won't belabor this point too much, but we just talked about data and all the complexities around it. Uh, certainly we do have some communities that are focused on data and building data pools together. And so you'll hear more and more about this, uh, I think over the next few years, as data lakes come online and industry blockchains uh, become a thing that people are interested in working on together. And that leads us to hardware. Um, open hardware is not a new concept. Um, I think it was back in 2005 when Sun Microsystems, in fact, David Marr, you may have worked on this, um, put out the UltraSpark processor under the GPL v2 license. Um, but at the time, you know, there's been many initiatives that were kind of one company doing one thing to open up one piece of their portfolio. Um, what we've seen in more recent times in the last few years is a more generalized interest in collaborating on the design, verification, and tooling around how actual processors and designs and cores, microprocessors, controllers, interconnects, uh, anything is fair game where companies are looking at the explosion of things that are coming online. Um, whether you start talking about cloud, you know, that's one thing, but then you start looking at all the devices, the cars, the autonomous vehicles, the IoT in industrial and in consumer spaces, and the number of demands and the different types of demands on uh, the needs for uh, cores and different types of uh, specifications around them has exploded. And so it's obvious to them, why not look at open source as the path for how we're, we're going to do this? Um, I won't spend too much time on some of these individual projects, but um, we do have the RISC-V Foundation that was formed in order to develop a neutral instruction set architecture. Uh, the idea there is to make it lightweight, flat, fast, and flexible, and to innovate quickly. Um, and RISC-V is an open, transparent, and it's available royalty-free under similar principles that you would expect from an open source license, but applied to hardware, which is different. Uh, the, the last discussions, I won't repeat them, but those were very important in the context of all of these. We have not necessarily figured out the ultimate solution here in terms of the intellectual property structure, but there's been a large ecosystem of organizations who have worked on building a solution that they're comfortable taking a shared risk and a shared responsibility for the future of. And so we have, I think, over uh, 250, 250 or 350 companies who are involved in RISC-V Foundation at this point. And I'll belabor this point, not because there's a lot of logos and there's a lot of interest from companies, but because for the first time, I think we're seeing a very large interested pool of commercial ecosystems coming together 
around these open hardware projects. And I think that's what differentiates it from a number of the various initiatives that have been done in the past. Um, in August, we announced our uh, relationship with the Open Power Foundation, and we started working with the Open Power Foundation on uh, a number of things um, in terms of their intellectual property structure, what they were doing. Um, and at the same time, IBM announced that it was going to be opening up the Open Power Instruction Set Architecture and Firmware so that others could build uh, and innovate uh, with them on those core components. And one interesting thing I'll point about Open Power Foundation is that we announced this in August and the, uh, uh, there was a, a microwatt is a project and this was more or less just set up as a proof of concept for a, uh, a soft CPU core um, that defined, that was uh, built off of the Open Power ISA. And uh, within two months they have made significant performance improvements. Uh, they have also just demonstrated MicroPython, which is a uh, controller implementation of Python, um, and they've demonstrated that running on a, uh, in, at Open Power Summit in San Diego. And then just two months later, they showed Zephyr, which is an open source RTOS that we host a completely different project, completely different set of organizations working on Zephyr, but is now running on an Open Power core. This is the type of innovation that we saw as the output of Linux and some of these other technologies that came before. And I point these things out because it is starting to happen in hardware. We are seeing these commercial ecosystems come together. Um, we also now have Chips Alliance, which is a, a community focused on design and verification tools. Um, there's a number of, of founding companies, but what I'll point out here is that this is through the entire stack that they're looking at in terms of what pieces and components make sense and are easy to share and, and take a, a, a shared risk and a shared responsibility for. It won't be everything, but there are certain areas that make a lot of sense, and this is where we'll see companies focusing, I think, going forward. And uh, while all these organizations are focused on different things, you have now, I think, a complete hardware stack potential where from the design verifications, uh, from the specifications to the design and verification tools and a lot of the core designs you now, and interconnects, you now have the ability to build an open hardware base. We have open firmware projects. Uh, I encourage you to check out Linux Boot if you've not seen that, which is an implementation of Linux for firmware and uh, all the way up to the operating system and above. You can have a complete open stack, which gets to some of the prior things I think Danny's going to be talking about later about Freedom Box and how do you build freedom into the system. Um, I think there's a lot of learnings in terms of how we might be able to go forward ten, within the next decade to build some of these sort of open design principles into the entire hardware infrastructure as well. So with that, I will give up the rest of my time. Oh, did we, t yep, yeah. Um, There's a barrier. Of so oh, this may have changed because I haven't looked at it recently, but um, one of the things that I thought is interesting in terms of licensing of the RISC-V ISA is the ISA itself, which is um, at the risk of I've offended other people saying this, is a copyrightable document specification, technical specification, is under uh, CC BY 4.0, I think. The code around it that the RISC-V Foundation uh, develops, I believe, is BSD3 clause, although what I find a bit um, miss, you know, the kind of confusing is on their website, everyone's like, oh, it's BSD3 clause, it's BSD3 clause. And, that distinction that CC BY covering the ISA document itself, which of course CC licenses specifically take, um, don't grant patent licenses, is something of note and also very distinct from what it sounds like with the open power intentions from your slide. I don't, I haven't seen that license yet. They didn't have it ready That's yet in out. August, but yeah, I'm not, I mean, okay, it hasn't come out yet. Okay. Yeah, it's a, I just looked at the microwatt thing. It looks like they're gonna update it when it's available. So yeah. anyway, um, I, like I said, I, I think right now we've got communities forming, you know, they're 
basing it on you know what works for them right now. I, I don't know if they, anybody's figured it out, as I said, and you know in terms of what the perfect solution or the the ideal solution is. But um, I do expect to see organizations changing, like Open Powers are going through the update process. Uh, Andy was oh Andy's actually heading for the doors now that I mentioned him. But uh, you know there's been a considerable work on trying to you know align a number of these two open source principles, and you know some are easier to accept in some of these communities and others and you know some of these are very large co co communities you know uh, risk five has I think 350 companies now um, signed up so it's I just was meaning time. they need to I think they need to be more clear about how that licensing works I don't think they're gonna be able to change that license on that ISA at this point given how old it is but we inherit some things and yeah. we move on and <laughs> you're in a position to help them though <laughs> improving the GPL v2 that you know <laughs> it'll be up to the, the the people involved taking that shared risk to make those improvements and you know certainly we're happy to help and guide them thank you um,